Okay, so hello, good afternoon, evening, morning, middle of the night, whatever it is where you are. Uh, welcome to the, the Sea Lion demo. So I'm going to introduce you to Sea Lion and hopefully give you a few tips and tricks that even if you've used it before, can help you to be more productive or at least know your way around a bit better. That's really what I want to get through in this demo is obviously show you a few things, but also just show you how easy it is to become productive. So here we are at just a uh, an, an empty Hello World program. Well, it's not empty. Usual Hello World boilerplate that most IDs will give you when you're creating your project. So I've just created this one, nothing else in it. And you can immediately see there's a CMake this.txt file here because we do use CMake as our default build system. We do now support a couple of others, including uh, make files more recently. And we can support further build systems by using the uh, compilation DB as input. We'll keep an eye out for, for other things coming in the future. But for now, if you open a new project, it's going to be CMake by default. You don't have to be uh, a CMake expert to, to be able to use it, but obviously becoming a little bit familiar helps. But C9 is going to manage most day to day stuff for you. So you may not even have to look in here. So, for example, if I go now and create a new class, I can give it a name, which I'm going to deliberately misspell for the moment. And you can see it's uh, giving me an option to create a header only or separate implementation file, which is what I'm going to do. And it's going to also add that to the, the CMake file, as you can see down here. We can even go in and customize what the, um, uh, the file extensions are if we really want to. But we'll stick with the defaults and create that file now. And it's immediately created a load of boilerplate. Nothing terribly interesting yet, but we can see we get the, the header guards there generated. And uh, we had an interesting question uh, the last time I did this demo, actually. Can the header guards include GUIDs? And apparently, there is a way to do that. These are quite configurable. You can also get it to put Pragma once there, if you prefer. But notice it's already highlighting this. And if I hover over that for a second, because it's actually spotted the typo right there in the hash define. And not only that, but it gives me the chance to, to rename it. I can either click this here, or I can use a, uh, one of the ubiquitous keyboard shortcuts on my Mac, it's Option Enter. On Windows and Linux, that will be uh, uh, Alt Enter. So I'm going to call it Alt Enter from now. And I can just get it to automatically correct that for me. Uh, oops, I just overtype it. Now notice that although it did these two in real time, it also changed the comment afterwards, it actually searched through the rest of the code to see whether it needed to make the same change somewhere else, even though that was in the comment. And I just need to do the same thing again for the for the class name. And just fix that. And it's also asking if I want to rename the file. So that's actually quite a safe name change. So there we are, we've got our monster class. Let's give it some state now. So I might want to have a, a score, which I'll start at um, a zero. But monsters have a height. We'll leave that uninitialized. And we'll give it a name as well. And that's given me some red code. And it's even telling me what the um, what it is I need to do, which is to include string. But because it knows that, it can even do it for me. Again, Alt Enter, or Option Enter, we'll just add that hash include for me and fixes the problem. And I didn't have to leave the line of code that I was on. And this can often be a really great opportunity to not get out of the flow of what you're writing and, and jump around trying to think what the header files are you need to include and put them in the right place. It will just do it for you. So that's quite nice. So I've got some variables in there. Now, as well as fixing code, we can also generate new code. So I did command N here again on my Mac for the, the generate menu. And we can generate lots of different boilerplate things that C++ makes tedious. So we'll give it a constructor. And we won't initialize score because that's initialized in the class. We will just initialize the other two. And I could generate it in place, but I want to do this in the implementation file. There it is. I can toggle between the header and the implementation file with, with one key. Uh, it's quite a lot of boilerplate it's done for us, and it even knows how to pass a std string. Um, we usually do that by, by const ref, except that these days, 
device is generally to pass by value and used to move, put this sort of thing out if we're storing it in the constructor. And this has actually come from Clang Tidy, which we have integration with as well. So as well as our own inspections, uh, and in fact, we're moving more of our own inspections into Clang Tidy to use as our um, static analysis engine. And that, again, can make that change for us, which I can do here or just alt enter and we make the change. Now passing by value, it's moving it into the to the member variable, and it's even known that it needed to include utility to get std move. So that's quite nice. Again, if I go back to the header file now, you saw that there were a number of other things that I could generate. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I do want to point out the equality operators. I find these really, really valuable. Because until C20 at least. We don't usually get these um, given to us for free. So it's nice to be able to generate them. And implementation is trivial. It's just tedious to write. There's a number of ways we can do this. Again, we can select which variables partake in that. Uh, we can generate not equal as well. Do it as a class member or outside the class. And I'm going to use uh, std tie to generate that. And we'll see what that does. So what that's done is, although we could have done it as a cascading series of comparisons, std tie actually forwards on to std tie's implementation of equals, which just works in terms of its members. And this just optimizes out. So it's generally going to be um, no overhead compared to doing it uh, the other way. I just think it looks nicer. And just because you're generating code doesn't mean that it shouldn't look nice. And then we see not equals written in terms of that as well. So that's done quite a lot for us. Let's so say we could go through looking at all the other things we could generate. But um, most of the time, rather than writing new code, which we'd love to do, we spend looking around existing code, uh, particularly code that may not be so familiar with us uh, to us. So um, having ways to navigate code is really important as well. So what I'm going to do now is switch to another code base that we can we can use to have a look around. So this is actually the catch2 code base. So uh, I'm the original author of, uh, of catch and then catch2, although I haven't been maintaining it uh, the last year or so. Other people have been doing a better job than I have. But it's now a fairly mature code base. So a nice one to, to try and have a look around. So of course, we do have finding files, which I can bring up with just um, or shift command F on my, on my Mac and start typing things straight away. and immediately just get all of the hits across the code base for these uh, free form strings. So if you need finding files, pretty much first in class for that, but we can do better. If we do shift shift, which is one of the easiest to remember shortcuts, this will bring up what we call search everywhere. And if I type uh, match there, that will find all classes that contain the word match as well as files, symbols, even actions, and we'll look at those in a moment. And this is like a summary view. We can drill down for more details in these tabs, go to files and symbols, we'll come back to actions. Going back to all for a moment, as well as doing a just a normal word search, if I type um, C E T R, you can see what it's doing now is it's actually looking at initial letters. So it's recognized the underscores in this file name, and realizes that actually these are the, the initial letters. Um, and it can do even multiple initials. I do C A E T R, it's picked up C A from catch. This is actually a really powerful way of doing search where we often find that we have these common prefixes and then the variable part is towards the end, and we can get all of that in the fewest possible keystrokes. So that's pretty good as well. Now I'm just going to set up a particular file for the next bit. So I mentioned that, oops, go back into the right thing, but uh, we'll come back to action. Action, it turns out, is so important, it has its own shortcut. If I type find, we can see that. Uh, find action is the, is the feature. So shift um, control A, sorry, shift command A on my Mac, if I do that, 
That brings this up. That's exactly what it does. It allows you to find actions, exactly what it says on the sin. So all of the features across the whole of sea lion we can find using that same powerful search tool here, like if I want to find uh, all the, the, the generators, uh, including the ones that are not in context right now. I can see them all here, along with their keyboard shortcuts and uh, menu paths, if they have them. So this is really powerful, and this is a great way of finding your way around sea line, or rather, deferring what you need to know about it until you need it. If you think you need a feature, come to find action, try some search terms, and you'll find an action that will take you to the right place in the IDE. So let's look at one of those. I'm going to have a look at um, format. And down here, reformat code. If I select that, you saw the code jump there. So it's just, just reformatted this source file. Um, it's quite a big source file. It's probably done quite a bit there. Difficult to get a feel for what it really did when it did something like that automatically. So maybe we would have a look in version control and see what the difference is. But sometimes that's a bit too, too much of a blunt instrument. It's not fine grained enough. So we have another feature. So in the VCS menu, so we do have version control integration, of course, but we also have a feature called local history. And local history, if I do show history, will show us something that looks very much like version control. But all of these commits here are fully automatic. I didn't have to perform these. They happened on every save, every time I rolled back, ran tests. We'll get an entry in here, and we'll be able to see the diffs between them. So we shouldn't rely on this as a form of version control. That's not its purpose. Uh, think of it more as a, a very powerful undo, which lets you do things like you would in version control, but without necessarily having version control. And I find this particularly useful if you're doing uh, test-driven development, because every time you run the tests, you'll get an entry in here, you'll see where the, where the tests pass, where they fail, and you can always roll back to the last good state. It's a really powerful feature. And that way you can only then commit to version control when you feel you need to. So I think I am out of time. So I'm going to have a look to see whether there are any questions. Uh, would it be terribly troublesome to add a space between the header guard end if comment start and the header name in the comment? Um, not sure of hand. What do you mean by that now, but header guard? Or... Ah, there, I mean. Yeah, I think that's all configurable, if I remember rightly. Uh, I know what you mean that annoys me as well. Uh, I believe that's that's something we can configure, but we can have, we can have a talk about that afterwards. And I think that's the only question there. So I'm going to go back to the table now. If you've got any more questions, do come and chat with us. Uh, I'll see you there.